It's so wonderful to be back at the Oxford Union. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for being here. Well, on the day when your Prime Minister is struggling to beat her cabinet into submission <laughs> and to force them to acquiesce to what I've termed back in 2016 as the most likely outcome of this Brexit process, the Hotel California Doctrine, where according to the last verse of the song, you're too young to remember the Eagles song, but let me remind you what the last verse was. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. <laughs> well, it may seem impertinent on a day like this to be talking about the Euro and to be putting forward the proposition in sharp contrast to what Mr. Dombrovsky said in this chamber a few weeks ago, that the Euro has never been more problematic. Now, I will also try to convince you that the question of the euro is not as separate from that of Brexit as it may seem. But let me begin at the beginning with uh, Mr. Dobrovsky's uh, three main points. I don't know how many of you were here to listen to him. I, wasn't, I read his remarks. The three points he made was that, firstly, Europeans who live and labor under the euro are better off as a result of the euro. The second point he made was that the euro was actually uh, a very useful and helpful instrument for Europeans during the European crisis. And thirdly, that it is a success story, that it is stronger than ever. Well, my first task tonight is to counter every single one of those myths. I shall argue that the euro was not, has not only not made Europeans better off, but it has inflicted a historic defeat upon European capitalism. Secondly, that rather than proving uh, helpful in uh, the crisis that uh, followed 2008, what the euro has done, the euro's architectural design, amplified massively the tsunami that hit the continent of Europe, initially from Wall Street through the city of London with the financial sector collapse and consequently led to the current political disintegration, the disintegration of the political center, whose only true beneficiaries are racist, xenophobic, ultra-right-wingers that are coalescing now in a dystopian front, which is a clear and present danger for civilization in Europe. These are strong claims. Before supporting them, let me um, point out a very Interesting, one might even call it a delicious paradox. One may say, well, if you're right, Yanis, that um, the euro has never been more, more problematic, why do the money markets value the euro so highly compared to the pound, to the American dollar, and so on? Well, allow me to point out that there is no paradox here. Suppose you are a Singaporean, Chinese, American, or indeed a German investor. You have money. Yeah? And for some reason, you agree with me that the fragmentation of the Eurozone is at an advanced stage, and the Euro has never been uh, weaker or more problematic. Should you sell your Euros? No. Let me share a secret with you as to what you should do you should shift your euros to a German bank account. Why? Because if the euro breaks up, how will it break up? It won't break up because Greece leaves the euro. It won't break up because Italy uh, leaves the euro. The euro will break up if it breaks up. I'm not wishing that it does, mind you. I'm simply describing the future as I see it. The way it will happen is Germany will leave the euro once the Berlin political class has had enough of the riffraff, you know, us Greeks, the Italians, the French, the Portuguese, and so on. The moment they start sniffing in the wind the possibility that they may have to bail out 2.7 trillion euros of Italian debt. Believe you me, the Buddhist Bank already has plans in the drawer for printing Deutschmarks. Now, what will happen then? Immediately, all German accounts will be redenominated from euros to Deutschmark. Immediately, because Germany has a gigantic current account surplus, the Deutschmark is going to go through the roof. 
So if you happen to have euros in Deutsche Bank, Finance Bank in Frankfurt, they will appreciate you are going to get a magnificent windfall. So can you see how the paradox dissolves? The nearer we're getting to any potential fragmentation of the euro, the higher the value of the German euro, of euros in Germany. Of course, what will happen is euros will be shifted from Italian bank accounts to German bank accounts. By the way, do you know this is already happening? We have about 200 billion in the last 18 months, 200 billion that has shifted from Italian bank accounts to German bank accounts because of the risk of keeping your euros in a country that after the breakout, the breakup of the Eurozone, will see its currency redenominated downwards, not upwards. So, therefore, the fact that the Euro is a strong currency, it's a little bit, you know, back in the 1950s, those magnificent Jaguars, uh, the cars, I mean, that were extremely strong cars, extremely strong cars, but if you had an accident in one of them, you ended up dead. The car didn't bend much, huh? did not crumble, had no crumble zones. It would be intact. You would be dead, though. That's the euro for you. The stronger it is, the weaker the population, labor, and living under it, the way that it has been designed. Now, let me say, move to the, to, to, to the second issue. No, actually, I won't move to the second issue. I'm just going to table the question and then come back to it a bit later. The second question is, well, if I'm right, how can it be that smart Eurocrats, people in the European Commission, the European Central Bank, cannot see that, and only I can see the truth? Leave this question in abeyance. I'll come back to it. My argument will be is that, they, of course, they can see it, the smart ones. But you'll see why the design of the Eurozone makes no difference as to whether they can see it or not. Now, time some facts, for some facts. You heard the story that the euro eliminated transaction costs, so much, much easier going from one country to the other. That, that is, of course, true. But let me ask you a question. If transaction costs were so important, why is it that there is no monetary union between Australia and New Zealand? Why do they have separate currencies? Why do they pay fees for transacting when they move into, you know, from, from Sydney to uh, Christchurch. Why has there been no monetary union between Norway and Sweden? Such similar countries, they are next door to each other, they trade a lot with one another. Why don't they create a monetary union? Why doesn't Canada unite monetarily with the United States? Most of Canada's trade is with the United States. There's, I can't tell the difference between American and Canadian accents, I know you can, but <laughs> these would be the obvious monetary unions. The answer is that transaction costs are not that important. What matters is convergence of economies, investment, the way that supply chains are linked together. And let me say that from that perspective, the euro has not just been a failure, it has been pointless. Allow me to compare and contrast two different countries, the Czech Republic and my country. The Czech Republic is in the EU, but not in the Eurozone. Greece is in both. In 1995, the Czech Republic's uh, per, capita per capita income was 18% of that of Germany. 1995. Huh? In Greece, it was 48%. Greek per capita income in 1995 was 48% of German per capita income. What is it today? The Czech Republic's per capita income is 48% of German per capita income, and the Greek one has gone down to 41%. So, it really didn't matter that the Czech Republic did not have the euro, and Greece did. Indeed, if you look at the convergence, the real economic convergence, and convergence in prosperity within the eurozone, we had divergence, the opposite of convergence, whereas between countries like Hungary, Poland, and the Czech Republic that do not have the euro, and the rest of rich eurozone, of the rich parts of the eurozone, like the Netherlands, Austria, and Germany, you have convergence. So the euro was pointless from the perspective of economic integration, bringing peoples together in terms of production, in terms of consumption, and in terms of prosperity. 
but it was worse than pointless. It was truly destructive. I'm not saying this as the former finance minister of a bankrupt country. I'm only saying this as a European. Consider this. Anyone who borrowed in 2008, anyone who borrowed in dollars to invest in Wall Street, made by today, from 2008 to today, about 51%. So for, you know, if you borrowed $100 uh, dollars and you invested it on average in Wall Street, you end up today with 151. If you did this, the same thing in South Korea, you would break even. If you invested $100 in uh, Frankfurt or Paris, European equities, you would have lost one third. So there was a lot of wealth destruction. It is not just a question of inequity within the Eurozone. It is also that the Euro has created circumstances that destroyed a lot of wealth of a lot of rich people as well. So it was both inequitous and inefficient. Let me give you another example. Take Germany. Germany is the greatest beneficiary of the Eurozone. Between 2000, when the Euro began, and now, because effectively the Euro is another form of the Deutschmark, let's not fool ourselves, the fact that the riffraff of Europe was part of the Euro, of the Deutschmark, like it was our currency, the currency of the Italians, you know, the Mediterraneans, uh, the grasshoppers of Europe, huh? it kept the value of the currency low. And that was a great boon to German exporters. So, I just did the back of the envelope calcula cal uh, calculation on the train here. The total net export surplus of G German industry between 2000 and 2018 was 2.2 trillion. 2.2 trillion euros, not bad. Now, what do you do if you are constantly in surplus with somebody else? If I'm constantly in surplus with you, it means I keep selling more stuff to you. But if I keep selling more stuff to you, then I end up with your money, and I don't have anything to do with that money. So the result was that there was a lake of euros accumulating in the banks of Frankfurt. And you know, the worst night nightmare of a banker is to have money that they are not lending. They don't sleep at night. If they have money and they're sitting on it, and there is not enough demand for that money. So what do they end up doing? Lending it to the Greeks. Lending it to the Irish. Because why? Think about it. Greece, what did Greece and Ireland and Portugal bring into the Eurozone? They did not bring the fantastic cars. We don't produce cars, okay? We, what, what were we producing? Some oranges, apples, uh, some olive oil. But we brought one amazing asset into the Eurozone. 92% of houses were owned by the residents. We didn't have mortgages, we didn't have credit cards, with really low levels of debt. I know it sounds strange, but the greatest asset that Greece brought into the Eurozone was low levels of debt. And collateral. You know, we had low incomes, we were unproductive, we were slightly corrupt, we were all those things, but we owned our homes and we did not own money. You know what we were? We were the apple in the eye of German bankers. A banker looks at you. You do not owe money to anyone. You own your own home, and you're thirsty for washing machines, German cars, imports. You are a wet dream for a German <laughs> banker. So what do they do? They lend you. And suddenly, everything's fantastic. From 2000 to 2008, the Eurozone resembled a majestic riverboat that was launched onto a calm, still ocean. It looked splendid, because it was a riverboat. It was not an ocean-faring vessel. The moment we had the first crisis, the first storm, it started sinking. Why? Because the money that was lent by the German and the French banks, but mainly the German banks, to the periphery, take Ireland, for instance, Remember the huge bubbles, which are now repeating themselves, by the way. That's another story. They created a fantasy, the delusion of prosperity. 
people were getting credit cards. I mean, I was receiving in Greece credit cards that I had not applied for. No, seriously. No, I'm not, I'm not joking. There was a deluge of credit cards that people were receiving in the mail. All you had to do was to sign it and start spending. And, and we had to tear them up and burn them, but some people used them. Yeah? So that created demand for imports. Everybody was happy. It was vendor finance. It's like me going into a car dealer, a Ferrari car dealer, saying, I want the car and I want the money to buy it. And they were giving you. So suddenly, you know, lots of sales of Ferrari cars. I mean, it wasn't Ferrari cars, it was Porsches. Do you know Greece had the highest percentage of Porsche uh, four-wheel drives in Europe? It was not the oranges <laughs> that purchased. It was loans from German banks. And nobody forced them to give it to us. Now, I'm not blaming them. I mean, I'm blaming the Greeks. Just for every irresponsible borrower, ladies and gentlemen, there is an irresponsible lender. But this is the structure of a monetary union when, w that lacks the federal treasury. What happens is there is a period of exuberant growth, both in the surplus and the def deficit countries. During that period, gigantic bubbles are being built in the economies of the deficit countries and in the banking sectors of the surplus countries. And then something happens, usually in Wall Street, right? 1929, 2008, the bubbles burst, and then it's catastrophe. We had that in Europe, and Britain was part of that. It was called the gold standard, fixed exchange rates, a currency union during the mid-war period. And John Maynard Keynes wrote a fantastic piece, The Economic Consequences of Mr. Churchill, who was then the Chancellor of the, of the Exchequer that brought Britain back into the Euro of the time, the gold standard, uh, the result being that Britain suffered massive recession as a result of that. And then after 1929, thankfully, you got out of it in 1931 by cutting the peg. Now, the problem, however, is there is no peg to cut in the Eurozone because we didn't keep our currencies. We didn't just have fixed exchange rates. In the mid-war period, you had the pound, the French had the franc, the Americans had the dollar, and you just had fixed exchange rates. And that was just a matter of an overnight decision by government to sever. But we have the euro everywhere. And we have this remarkable situation where in our infinite wisdom, this is an ironic phrase, <laughs> just in case you didn't get it, we created, think about it, you only have to state it to realize how absurd the situation with the eurozone is. We created a central bank, the largest central bank in the world in terms of the size of the economy that it handles. The European economy is the largest economy in the world. Bigger than America, bigger than China. So we have a, a megalith of a central bank without a treasury to have its back. And we have 19 treasuries that have to bail out national banking systems without the help of a, a central bank. Why? Because the Central Bank of Europe was designed never to bail out the riffraffs, banks, and states. The Italian ones, the Greek ones, and so on. So the, the rule was the central bank does not print money even during moments of emergency in order to sustain the monetary union that we've created. So think about it. In 2008, when the bottom fell out of the uh, Eurozone, hmm? the Fed the Central Bank of the United States of America started printing money as if there is no tomorrow to reflow the banking system. The Bank of England was doing the same. The Bank of Japan was doing the same. The, the Bank of China, the Chinese government, d did the most magnificent uh, operation in salvaging global capitalism by boosting the rate of investment from 33% to 51% of GDP. And this is what, together with the Fed and the Bank of England, kept capitalism alive. Let's be clear on this. And what did Europe do? They shifted the gigantic losses of the idiotic banks onto the shoulders of the taxpayers. It's called austerity. George Osborne and I had disagreements. He believed in expansionary contraction. That is, expansionary monetary policy, printing money to help the financial sector recover, while at the same time, doing some austerity. 
which was a major error on behalf of Osborne. But nevertheless, that's not the issue today. We can have another debate on this. But at least there was the expansionary part and the contractionary part. George thought that this was a, a, a good mix. It wasn't, but he thought it was a good mix. We can disagree about this. But what we cannot disagree is that what the European Central Bank was doing was a crime against logic. They were doing contractionary contraction in the middle of the worst crisis of capitalism. They were shrinking the money supply and doing austerity, shifting all the pain that the banks had created through their idiotic bets, especially bets that they were taking out in the United States with dollars they were borrowing from Wall Street. And they shifted all this pain onto the Greek taxpayers, the Latvian taxpayers, the German taxpayers. Now, this is what you do if you want to poison the politics and the democracy of Europe. And this is exactly what has done. Now, what has changed since then? Europe, continental Europe, the Eurozone, has affected a number of changes. Each and every one of them is the minimum that was necessary in order to keep the Euro alive, while at the same time maximizing the discontent on the ground. And the discontent, not just of the Greeks and the Portuguese and the Irish, but of the Germans. Do you know that as we speak today, 40-year-olds in Germany are experiencing the worst level of inequality in the last 25 years? Do you know that half of the population of Germany today is worse off than they were 15 years ago? And that is something that we really must note, because Germany is swimming in money. It's not Greece. Okay, we are goners. But Germany has, well, you had 2.2 trillion surplus, current account surplus. Huh? It has corpor corporations that are saving huge quantities of money. They are in surplus. Families that are saving. And the federal government that is in surplus. They are in surplus. So everybody is in surplus. Yeah. And yet 50% of the population are worse off today than they were 15 years ago. Why? Well, it's really very simple, ladies and gentlemen. You don't need to be an economist to understand that. If everybody is in surplus, who is in deficit? Because my surplus is the deficit. I cannot have a surplus without somebody owning a deficit. The answer is, of course, they are exporting the capital to foreigners. They are entrusting the savings of the German people and German industry huh, to foreigners. While within Germany, because they are doing this, there is the lowest level of investment since 1946 as compared in proportion of the savings and the liquidity available. So the point I'm making, again, I made it before, I will repeat it once again, is that the euro has been a devilish design, a design that was, it was a little bit, like, okay, let's not be too scientific, it's too late in the day. It's my third speech today. So it's a bit like removing the shock absorbers from your car and driving it into a pothole. What do you expect will happen? Now, and this is the time to return to the question that I left in abeyance before. Remember the question? How can smart people not know that? They do know it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is malice by design. This is designer idiocy. Why am I saying that? Well, François Mitterrand, very smart man, understood very well that the monetary union that we now have in Europe is not sustainable. He understood it. The question is, why did he do it? The answer he gave in a private conversation with a very close friend of mine who used to be a member of parliament here in Britain was this. I do not have, speaking imperially, you know, like French presidents do, <laughs> I do not have the power, the authority to bring about a federation but I can bring about with Helmut, Helmut called the Chancellor of Germany at the time, I can bring about a monetary union that is going to create a massive, a, a massive crisis and then the people that will succeed us will have no alternative but to create a federation. But he was precisely wrong. Where he, he was wrong was that, yes, the currency union would create a gigantic crisis, 
Dissolving this monetary union would be extremely painful for everyone, independent of whether you agree with the euro or not. And I make no bones about it. It would be catastrophic for all of us, even for people of Britain, because you are too close to the, uh, to the continent of Europe, whether you are in the EU or not. Huh? But the crisis that the monetary union is capable of producing poisons democracy. If you go now to Germany, if you go to Italy, if you go to France, even to Greece, and you say to, to people that which I say, because I believe in it, what we need is a federal solution. We need more Europe. They say, no way. More Juncker? More Merkel? Go away. And they jump on the bandwagon of the disintegrationists, and in particular, the disintegrationists that offer them the simple answers that always flourish during periods of deflation. It is the Jews' fault, the Syrians' fault, the Greeks' fault, the Germans' fault. Huh? Everybody agrees it's the French who are to blame. <laughs> okay? These lazy answers always flourish during periods of deflation. Deflation, ladies and gentlemen, was always going to be the result of this particular design of the euro. And deflation begets monsters. It was Mussolini, it was Hitler, now it is Salvini, Kurz, Zehofer, Le Pen. All those people that Steve Bannon is organizing and putting together in a fascist international. And this is something you should have in mind here when you welcome him to this chamber. And I hope that you challenge him on this. Before we move to questions, let me say that the Euro's design is one thing, but the politics should be another. We are not playthings of historical forces beyond our control. We have the power, unlike molecules and unlike DNA, through the power of reason and through dialogue in fora like this one, to change the world we live in, to change the institutions. But for this, we need democracy. For this, we need dialogue. Unfortunately, the Euro's design has created a vicious cycle between failed institutions that create failed policies that lead to discontent, and then the only way the powers that be in Brussels can clamp down and continue to impose their authority is through increasing degrees of authoritarianism. So, failed policies breed authoritarianism. Authoritarianism maintains failed policies. Those failed policies lead to even more authoritarianism, which can either take the form of the Salvinis, the strongmen, the Urbans, that want to effectively take us back to the 1930s, or it takes the form of Mr. Dobrovskis. Because, let me tell you why I'm here today. I was invited by the good people of the Oxford Union during the summer, it was, maybe early summer, to be here a few weeks ago to argue against Mr. Dobrovskis. But when Mr. Dobrovskis office found out that I am going to be the one that opposes him, he demanded of the good people of the Oxford Union that I should be, and I was disinvited. It was not one of the union's finest hours that they disinvited me, even though I appreciate the offer for me to come a few weeks later. But it is a disservice to you that you didn't have Mr. Dobrovskis and me fighting this good struggle uh, in front of you so that he would have the right to reply to what I'm saying. The quality of our democracy is of the utmost importance. We must maintain dialogue, I am not one of those who believe in not giving a platform to opponents, however vile they might be, but I am not going to accept what the European Union is doing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the rift between leavers and remainers in this country 
is the result of the ill-fated design of the euro. If the euro had not been designed the way it was, there would be no Brexit now. But it was designed that way, and Brexit triumphed in June of 2016. I fought against Brexit. Nobody can accuse me of being a lackey of Brussels. But I thought it was a mistake. At the same time, I think that the idea that there is something called a people's vote is offensive to those who were voted for leave in the first referendum as if they were not a people. I believe that this rift has to be healed in this country. I don't believe that Mrs. May is capable of doing it, but I think that the next generation, and that is you, have um, a golden opportunity and a moral duty to go ahead with this healing. It is essential that we on the continent, and you in Britain, independently of what happens with Brexit, maintain a commitment to uniting together as Democrats to deal with the four crises that are tearing our societies apart. Of private debt, of too low investment in green technologies that will be the technologies that save our jobs in the future and the planet, anti-poverty drive and public debt. These are like climate change. You cannot solve these problems in Britain alone. We cannot do it in Europe, in Greece, in France. We need to do it together. It doesn't matter whether we maintain this EU, we change the EU, what kind of Brexit, we need to coordinate along those lines. And we must unite to fight the rising nationalist international that Mr. Bannon, utilizing the divisions in Europe caused by the European Union's terrible design, is coming here because Mr. Trump and Mr. Bannon care about one thing. They want a divided reactionary Europe as being instrumental to their plans for the United States vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. And let me finish with an aside, which is, I think, pertinent to the point I was making about the authoritarianism of the European Union and they are trying to escape genuine dialogue. Some time ago, I was invited to another debate with a certain Mr. Steve Bannon in Ireland. He, ag he agreed, I agreed, and then he pulled out. So, the onus is on, on you to challenge him whenever it is that he's coming to this fine chamber. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I think that aside at the end is good advice for myself and everyone else in this room uh, as we consider the events on Friday. I want to begin by asking about the political impetus. You, you mentioned crises ranging from personal to national debt or climate change. At a time in which it seems that uh, the left, and the, particularly populism, is reasserting national identity, how are you optimistic that your movement can bring about a European identity that encourages European solutions to these problems? My only source of optimism is when I talk to people. Uh, it's not the media, it's not uh, opinion polls, it's dialogue with people on the street, in chambers like this, across Europe. So our Democracy in Europe movement, DiEM25, is mobilizing everywhere. Wherever we go, we find the contradictions of today's world. We have the best and the worst. We have people, even the worst, are okay. Most people who support fascistic parties, they're not fascists. They are just angry. They feel disenfranchised. They feel like cattle whose market value has tanked and who are being treated as such by the establishment. I think that it, the, the, the progressives, the so-called you know, liberal democratic um, establishment, so-called, they are neither liberal nor democratic, <laughs> um, they are making a crucial error in demonizing those people. So look at you know, the hardcore remainers, the way they demonize Brexiteers. They call them racist, they call them this, that, and that. In the United States, you have the ridiculous situation where the Democratic Party is going to the people who voted for Trump and saying, you were duped by Putin. Putin stole the election through Facebook. My goodness. I mean, what an insult to people who, by the way, most of those people who voted for Trump had voted for Obama in 2008. How can you say to them they are, they are racist and that they were duped by Putin? I mean, 
Did Putin try to influence the election of the United States? I'm sure he did, but I did too. <laughs> I did, I really did. I did my best to influence the election and failed spectacularly. And Putin had, I'm, I'm sure, about the same impact that I had. Okay, so this, the, I think this is really very important. We do not sacrifice good people to the ultra-right by treating them like morons and by demonizing them. This is crucial. We have to win the battle of ideas by treating people with respect independently of whether they agree or even like us or not. Given that the whole structure of the European Union reinforces national divisions in politics, particularly in the parliamentary elections, how difficult is it to build a uh, political movement that has genuine impact in all of those countries when you have such clear divisions and ties of domestic political parties to their representation in Europe? It's really very hard, but all good things in life are very hard to achieve, but otherwise they wouldn't feel good. Um, look, I have no idea whether it will succeed or not. I think what your president is referring to is the fact that DiEM25 is the first attempt to have a pan-European unitary movement. So we don't have, you know, a branch in France and a branch in Germany and the Germans decide amongst themselves what they want for Germany and the French what they want for France. Let me give you a very simple example. We set up a new political party in March. We call it MERA, MERA 25. MERA mean, means day or diem um, in Latin. So um, our electoral program what we are proposing regarding fiscal policy, social policy, climate change, um, banking, everything, was debated by all our members, including Germans, Portuguese, British members. We don't give a damn whether you're in the EU or not. Europe is one thing, and we do not conflate Europe with the European Union. And then we all voted for the final version of the Greek political party. We're doing this, the same thing on the 24th and 25th of November for our German party, Demokratia in Europa. So we are trying a different kind of transnational progressive politics that is a new model. Is it going to succeed? Probably not. But so what? As I keep telling my friends, uh, I know that I'm going to die and I'm sure you will also die, I hope not for a very long time, but this is not a reason not to wake up in the morning optimistic. So, we shouldn't really care so much about the outcome of what we do, we should care about what we do. I want to ask then about your, your time as finance minister, um, <laughs> and it was widely reported that you considered readopting the drachma, uh, and I was wondering uh, how true that was, how genuine of a policy commitment that was. I'm guilty. And what, what led you to not follow through with that decision? I'm guilty. I'm guilty, absolutely guilty. But, you know, so is Dr. Schäuble, the finance minister of Germany, and every other finance minister worth their salt. The euro is a fragile construct. Every bank in the world, not just in Europe, has a plan for Grexit, a plan for Italexit, yeah? a, 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 you know, a, a plan for Germany, it's what I was saying before, reissuing the Deutsche Bank. Everybody, if they don't, they are remiss. They, they have not fulfilled their duties to their shareholders as bankers. So every bank has a plan for Grexit. The European Central Bank, I know it had a plan. I read it, it's called Plan Z. So I called mine Plan, plan X, I had run out of letters. <laughs> yeah? uh, and, and it's important. It doesn't mean that you want to activate it. But the moment I became finance minister, I was immediately, first day I was finance minister, I was told in no uncertain terms, if you don't sign on the dotted line of cutting pensions further, of selling your railways for a pittance to a bankrupt company, you know, just amazing requirements that, that dissolve any sense of national sovereignty or common sense. Unless you do all that, we will close down your banks. What? No, that's a coup d'etat. This, this is what, you know, even the CIA was not doing that to banana republics in the 1950s. And it was happening in Europe in 2015. So the only way of, of saying to them, listen, I have, a, I have an outside option. If you push me too much, I will, yeah, I will go to the drachma. I had steps planned before going to the drachma because I didn't want to go to the drachma. So I, my plan was for a parallel payment system that was euro-denominated that would act as a buffer and as it would buy us time 
so that the powers that be in Europe would uh, get their senses back and be able to pull back from the brink if necessary. But that parallel payment system could, at the touch of a button, become the foundation of a new currency. I, I should be um, chastised if I didn't have that plan. But like, you know, your MOD, they have, I'm sure, in their drawers, plans for responding to a French army invasion in Kent, right? I mean, that's what armies do. It doesn't mean they want it. It does not mean that they are warmongers who want war against France. It means that you should have a backup plan. So did being confronted with these sort of uh, horrible bargains upon your entrance to, to the government, did that change your views of the European Union or did it just confirm your worst nightmares? Did, were you truly shocked by the way it was governed? No, it, it, it simply confirmed that which I already knew. I had no illusions. I knew that I would be facing a wall of, uh, you know, what I refer to my, in, in my that's in the room book, uh, the Swedish national anthem routine that Theresa May knows very well. You walk in there, you are very well prepared, you put forward your case, and you expect people to shoot it down, to tell you what, why your proposals are wrong. And they don't. And they say things that are completely independent of what you've said. It is as if you just sung the Swedish national anthem. And I'm sure Theresa May has experienced that. Uh, I knew it was going to happen, but I had a major weapon. People say, oh, you walk, walked in there with that. I had the weapon. I, you know, I owed 320 billion, and I was not going to take another loan to pretend that I'm repaying it until and unless we had a sensible conversation. And I didn't mind. Because you see, if you owe a thousand quid to your bank, to Barclays, then you're in trouble. But if you owe 320 billion, they're in trouble. <laughs> I think with that, we'll move to some questions from the audience. Uh, so if you put your hand up and wait for a microphone to come to you, uh, we can then recognise you. Let's go first to the gentleman on the front row right here. Thank you. Can I start by saying thank you for such a, a wonderful talk? And I thoroughly enjoyed it. And from a personal perspective, can I say you're one of the um, few people who manages to unite both my Thatcherite father and socialist uncle um, in their enjoyment of your appearances. Um, but I just wondered, since you've now launched this pan-European movement, um, at least in all of our lifetimes, will a united Europe always remain a romantic ideal, or can it ever be a reality? Look, the answer is I have no idea, really. I mean, anybody who answers these questions is either lying to himself or to everybody else, or to both. Yeah? I have no idea what will happen. What I know is that the alternative to a united Europe is a dystopia. Let's say for a moment, just for a moment, let's, okay, suppose we are all now Brexiteers, yeah? not just Brexiteers, Exiteers, everybody should exit. Huh? What will happen? What's going to happen in Europe now if the Euro, however terrible it may be, dissolves? Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. There's going to be uh, a tectonic shift that divides Europe down the River Rhine and across the Alps. What will happen is Germany will recreate the Deutschmark and Austria, Holland, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia and the Baltics will join that, you know, the, the Deutschmark zone. They're not going to create their own currencies. They are too integrated with German heavy industry, Volkswagen, IG, Krupp and all that. Huh? That chunk of Europe, Northeast Europe, Calvinist Europe, call it whatever you want, is going to have a, a gigantic current, current account surplus in relation to the rest of the world. So the Deutsche Mark is going to go through the roof, as I was saying before. That will mean exports will fall, and there will be a substantial increase in unemployment in Germany, Poland, and those countries. So you're going to have falling prices, because the price of the currency goes up, deflation, with unemployment. In Germany, not good. The only people who will be benefit from that is the alternative for Deutschland and the various um, uh, folks who are uh, thinking uh, of the 1930s with glee, if you know what I mean. The rest of Europe, what's going to happen? The currencies in the rest of Europe will depreciate. That will create inflationary fo pressures. And you're going to have a combination of inflation and unemployment in France, Italy, Spain, and so on. 
Is this a Europe we want to live in? You think that through Brexit you are insulating yourself from that catastrophe? No. You are not going to be able to set sail for, you know, the Indian Ocean. It's a beautiful island, but it's immovable. You're going to remain very close to this kind of Europe. So a united Europe is something we must fight for. It doesn't matter exactly how it happens, but at least there has to be very, very close coordination of economic policy, of monetary policy, of investment policy, and we need free movement. The idea that you are going to elect big borders around Britain and you're going to have barbed wire fences and you will electrify them and you'll be safe. This is absurd. You're going to simply become very sad and very miserable if you do that. Okay? And, and the quality of the food is going to de deteriorate as well. <laughs> so, oh, by the way, you mentioned that, you know, one of the great joys and concerns I have in this country is that I'm very good friends with Tory cabinet ministers and members of the House of Lords of the Conservative Party and Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell and I get on with them and I say the same thing to all of them and we all agree. There must be something wrong <laughs> in this world. This is an indication. You know, the fact that both your socialist uncle and your Tory father like me is a sure sign. I, mean, I enjoyed it. But it's a sure sign that we live in a completely topsy-turvy world. Fantastic. Let's move on to the next question. And let's go to the uh, woman in the green jumper on the end of the row here. Hi, thank you. Um, I study po uh, populism and anti-democratic attitudes. And you talked about how democracy was so important moving forward. But Europe and the rest of the world are going through a crisis of political trust. And when there's low political trust, democracy and democratic institutions fail. So what do you propose to rebuild that trust following um, failed programs and failed institutions? Thank you. Well, the populism is a symptom. The fragmentation, the political center has not held in Europe. But how could it hold? When you're telling teenagers in the majority of countries in Europe, that there will be no life prospects in their lifetime. What do you expect them to do? Do you expect them to take it? Or do you expect them to be vulnerable to the sirens of xenophobia who say to them, ah, it's the bloody Germans, or the Jews, or the Greeks, or the Brits, or the French, or this, huh? They will do, th th those narratives of populist xenophobia always rise up to the surface when there is a massive crisis of capitalism and in particular when the crisis is deflationary not inflationary. Inflation is not a good thing. It eats into people's incomes, savings and so on. But it is deflation, as I was saying during my talk, that begets political monsters. People make a mistake, even some historians, in thinking that Adolf Hitler was the child of the hyperinflation. Not true. If you look at the rate of inflation in mid-war Germany, and you plot it against the electoral success, the votes of the Nazi, of the National Socialist Party, you'll see that while inflation was positive, even, even high, the Nationalist Socialist Party was getting minuscule proportions. It was after 1930 when Herr Brüning the treasurer of Germany then introduced austerity after 1929 and inflation turned into falling prices huh? that the Nazis skyrocketed. It is not an accident that we're having exactly the same thing now with deflationary forces that are a result of the imbalance between savings and investment. I speak like an economist now for a minute. We have a very major imbalance between savings and investment. And if you think about it, you don't need to be an economist. Think of savings as the supply of money to be invested, to be borrowed, and investment, the demand for investment funding. When supply exceeds demand, whether it's apples or money, the price falls. What is the price of money? It's the interest rate. The problem with the interest rate is that once it falls below zero, the pension funds of the German housewife, the pension funds start shrinking. And then she stops supporting Angela Merkel, and she turns to populism, to the IFD. This is what ha has happened. So what, how, how do we deal with this? 
we're not going to deal with it simply by good, you know, with nice rhetoric. We need to change the circumstances of people's lives. So we need investment. We need to push investment up because investment is what we need to create the good quality jobs that will create the incomes that will stop deflation. Uh, the markets won't do it on their own. The markets are stuck. In, those who own the money are too scared to invest it because they fear in a never-ending cycle of reinforcement of belief that others are not going to invest, their investment is, is not going to be profitable, they don't invest, the result is demand is low, sales are low, they say, ah, you see, we were right not to invest. So it's self-perpetuating. The only way to do it is by, for instance, having a large-scale investment program like the New Deal that FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, had in 1933. At the European level, you can have investment banks collaborating. Britain should have an investment bank. It doesn't. You should create one. We have the European Investment Bank. We have the KfW in Germany. They should issue bonds. The, our central banks should buy those bonds. The money should go into a green transition, green energy, green transport fund to create the jobs that will return optimism and that, on its own, will see populism away. We have time for one final question. Um, so let's go to the hand at the back. I can only see a red sort of jumper sticking up, and that's it. Yes, yeah, you there, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting, especially coming from Germany. Um, <laughs> I agree. So. You said, with reason, that given the political state and fragmentation, federalism and joint economic and fiscal policies is not the way forward in sustaining the euro. But yet on the other hand, you said that stopping the euro, exiting, and then creating this northeast and southwest split is also not the way to go. So do you have any proposal of how to do it better? Oh, please do not get me wrong. I'm a federalist. I want to see a federation a democratic federation. What I'm saying as a realist at the same time is that this crisis has poisoned our politics. Look at your country. You had a federal election, what, a year and a half ago? And um, it, Europe was never, never really discussed in your own country. Your country depends on Europe and Europe depends on your country. And it was not really a serious issue. Um, even Mr. Schultz, running as the head of the opposition SPD, rejected everything that Macron had said as necessary and minimum prerequisites for saving the Eurozone. Merkel did what Merkel does, which is, you know, being mercurial and simply winning um, one election after the other without ever having a vision about anything. <laughs> Even though she's a, very, she's a fine woman as, uh, at a personal level. And I'm, I thoroughly approved the two-week uh, epiphany she had to let the Syrians in, but then she reversed policy on this event. But anyway, so the point I'm making is that the politics is not allowing us before we stabilize the political economy of Germany. Before we give the half of the 50% the of the Germans who are feeling worse off today than they were before the hard sphere reforms, unless we give them a sense that Europe is good for them and that the solutions come from Europe, not the problems come from Europe then the German public is not going to be interested in the federal moves which are necessary. So we need two phases. The first phase is something like the investment program that I was advocating, which does not need any federal moves. We have the institutions. We have the European Investment Bank. We have the European Central Bank. But we can use them in a way that have never been used before to stabilize Europe, to create hope again amongst the people of Germany, the people of Greece, to see Europe as a realm of shared prosperity, not a realm of uh, individualized problems. And then we can have the discussion about the kind of democratic constitution that we must write together, the Germans and the Greeks. One of the greatest tragedies of the Euro crisis is that it was portrayed as a clash between Germany and Greece, between the Netherlands and Italy, between North and South. This is analytically false and politically toxic. In my view, what happened was that the grasshoppers of the, of the North, the bankers like Deutsche Bank, and the grasshoppers of the South, the Greek oligarchy, the Italian oligarchy, binded together 
before the crisis to create a gigantic bubble, the bubble burst, then they shifted all the pain to the German hardworking people, to the Greek hardworking people, and portrayed it as a north-south divide and a north-south clash. We need to overcome this. Great. Well, thank you very much for that question, and that concludes our event today. So thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> <laughs>